together. Um, so the first thing I would say is that, you know, when we think about nursing, we hear all the time that it's an art and it is, it absolutely is an art, but with every art comes a, a required amount of devotion and passion and, and preparation. And so those are the things that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, so who am I and why, why, why would I have any relevance here? Well, if you're going to paint a portrait of your, your typical, your normal nurse that uh, practices today in the United States, um, the average is 82.5% are female. Uh, the average age is between, uh, in, in mid 40s, 44. 61.9% uh, of them are white, and we don't have real good calculations, but we know that the majority are uh, cisgender and heterosexually based um, viewpoints that, that nurses have. And so if you were to put a target right in the middle of that, that is me. I'm female, I'm 44 years old, I'm, I'm white, and I uh, am and cishet as well. So it, it, it's an interesting place to be when you're the majority and you're in a place where we really need to learn and advocate for those who are not in a way that honors our experiences as well as the experiences of others. So this is a picture of my family. And I promise that I, that I will explain why this is important. Um, my, my father uh, did not graduate from high school. Um, he is illiterate. My mother has a technical degree. I was the oldest of their four children. Um, my parents didn't really understand education or the purpose of it beyond just, uh, you know, allowing you to find a job after high school. Uh, we, I grew up below the poverty line. Uh, I remember very vividly my parents choosing between milk and eggs at the grocery store. I had no idea really what college was or what that was supposed to be or why I would even go. So I uh, followed the trends of my parents and, and I married very young. I was 19 years old and we quickly had two children. I had no college experience. Um, and quickly, you know, the realities of life hit me very hard. And I, I learned that I needed to have some sort of profession that would financially support our family. And so my husband, who was self-employed uh, at the time, uh, and I decided that nursing would be a good career because I could get an associate's degree and I could uh, still be a mom and do all of the things that I wanted to do. So to the right is a, of the screen is a picture of me at my graduation from my associate's degree program at the community college with my husband and my two young boys. Um, the second one in the red between me and my husband, he was actually uh, in, my, in my belly while I was uh, doing my, my uh, general education to, to become a nurse. And so I've carried my children and my husband all the way through uh, my career. And then the second picture is a picture of my mom and she's giving me a hug uh, and I am crying because it was literally the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, you know, being pregnant and having small children, also caring for my, my mother who is mentally ill and has chronic illness. Um, as well as financially supporting my parents for a lot of reasons. Uh, I didn't think I was going to make it through uh, nursing school. And so it just hit me so hard. And I was so overwhelmed that I had been able to do something that no one in my family had been done had, had done before. And I was committed at that point to break the cycles that I had been born into. So this is, uh, this is my crew now. Uh, it, you know, we added another little cherry on top and uh, I did not ever think I would go on, but I did. And I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and a PhD in nursing education. And I really took to heart the words from Florence Nightingale where we can never really consider ourselves finished nurses, that we have to continually learn and grow and develop all of our lives. And part of this and part of my, uh, the reason for doing this was to show my daughter uh, and my daughter-in-law that, you know, there is no, there, there are no boundaries that 
that are, need to be put on us um, other than the ones that we put on ourselves. And so, you know, I think that it's, it's remarkable the things that we do um, today that even 50 years ago were not even feasible or possible for us. So this is my larger crew. Um, this is my parents. You can see them at the end with their four children. Um, this is also my daughter, Eliza, with uh, my niece, Mia. And Mia is going to be central to some of the things that I share today. But in this picture, you know, you think about a typical or again, I'm using the air quotes, normal family. And what you see in this picture is very much not what you get. Um, in this group of people, we have uh, non-binary, we have uh, sexual orientation differences, we have addiction, we have illiteracy, we have um, substance and, uh, and other kinds of addictions and, and abuse. We also have uh, violence and, and spousal violence in this group. And so there, I, I, I leave this in here because I think that while on the surface, every family uh, can appear in a certain way or someone can appear to have, have privilege, which, which we all do in some form, um, you don't really understand what's happening and is fully behind everything uh, within, a, within a family or the dynamics of any social structure. So Eliza and me are best friends. They have been since they were, were teeny tiny. They're a year and a half apart. Uh, Mia is, is adopted. Uh, she, she is uh, one of my very favorite people. She spends an incredible amount of time at our home. Um, and she has just been raised as, as part of, you know, the, the crew and there hasn't really been uh, any differences uh, in the way that she's been brought up versus the way that her cousins and siblings have been brought up. The challenge has been, as Mia has grown, that uh, Eliza, my daughter, has noticed the treatment of Mia being very different. And in the same social situations that that they are in together, she has she has begun to notice the 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 way that people treat Mia versus the way that Eliza is treated, and it has been further uh, you know heightened with Eliza going into uh, her last year of high school and recognizing the structural racism, the structural uh, you know differences that she has experienced from from her cousin. Um, we have a high rate of suicide in this area from minority uh, teens. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a systemic problem and something that uh, Mia has struggled with as well. She has attempted suicide, has, has, uh, has moved schools, has been the victim of extensive bullying, and uh, really is the reason why um, I'm here with you today to talk about this. During the height of COVID, uh, and, and a lot of the civil unrest that was happening, my daughter asked me a question about what was happening and why people were behaving the way that, that they were. And my response to her was, it's, it's just so complicated. And as soon as those words left my mouth, it really hit me that, you know what, it, that's, that's not an excuse. That's not an answer. It doesn't matter if it's complicated. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if this is hard to talk about that even if we don't have the words, if we don't have the experiences, if we don't even see the problem and we don't know and dot, 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 that we have an obligation as members of a community uh, to, to, to lean into that, to understand it and to uncomplicate it in a way that makes sense and also uh, builds those experiences and helps us to see the problem. So I love this quote. It's one of my very favorite books. I read it with my daughter. It's called Frankly in Love. Uh, it's by David Yoon, who is a Korean American national bestselling author. And in this book, he, make, he, he has this quote. He says, white people can describe themselves with just American. Only when pressed to do, do they, they go into their ethnic heritage. Doesn't seem fair that I have to forever explain my origin story with a silent hyphen whereas white people don't. It's complicated, but simple. It's simplicated. 
And I love this idea of the silent hyphen because everybody has a silent hyphen. And yet there are so many of us that don't have to explain past the hyphen because of the color of our skin, because of our gender, because of the community that we live in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's really what I would, I would uh, ask all of you to consider is what are those silent hyphens that we see people explaining because of the fact that, that they're in some way different than the social norm. And I love this, this idea of simplicated. Simplicated is a verb and it just means to make a system more complex so that the use of the system is easier or simpler. So when I think about simplicated, the best example I can think of is, is, our, is our phones, our technology, right? That's a very complex technology, but it's the, the design is, is there and the technology is there behind it to make our life simpler and easier. And so I think about that in terms of the way that we're caring for our patients, for our families, for our communities, and as we're advocating for change, we need to make things simplicated. We need to make the complex very simple and we need to make it user-friendly so that people understand. And we don't hear that, it, well, it's complicated. So I love this quote by Maya Angelou, words are things. You must be careful, careful about calling people out of their names, using racial pejoratives and sexual pejoratives and all of, the, all of that ignorance. Don't do that. Someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. They get on the walls, they get in your wallpaper, they get in your rugs, in your upholstery and in your clothes and finally in you. And so you think about all of these words and all of the, the terms that we use and the things that you know we associate with and the labels that we give ourselves and the labels that society gives us. And, and we want those things in good ways to get into us and to really get rid of the pejorative. So I want, this is just an interesting statement and I want you to think about this. Is this true or false? A person who has little in common with you cannot adequately advocate for your benefit. Just think about that. Is that, is that statement true or false to you? So I would say for me, that this has to be false. And the reason this has to be false is that I'm a nurse and part of my job is to be an advocate and to care for people who don't look, act, or, or believe as I believe. And, and so I have to be able to do this. Interestingly, this, this comment came from an article that was outlining why, uh, why white people cannot speak for, for uh, other minorities and other, other racial groups, which I found really interesting because in a lot of ways, yes, I don't have the experiences, I don't have the oppression, I do have the privilege, I do have a lot of these things, I don't have a lot of these things. And yet here we are in a situation where I, in, in all of my normalness, in all of my majority-ness, am in a position where I now have to advocate for the benefits and the support and health of others. So I love this. Um, this is a, an article, it's titled Institutional Racism in Nursing. And it really gives us three, three key factors to, to move the needle, to make the change and to do better. And, and when you think about that, it, what they say we need to do is to live by three guiding principles. The first is to honor the voices and listen to understand, which to me is a fundamental human right. Uh, second is to apply the lessons learned, the things that we've learned through history, the things we've learned through our career, through our profession. And then lastly, move forward in a sustainable way. And I think the sustainable part is really, really important. Um, I, you know, some call it moving from a moment to a movement. This isn't something that we're going to solve quickly. And we need to think about what we can do for the long haul. So again, uh, Florence, nursing is progressive and uh, anything that stands still is, is to go backwards. And we have a lot of ground to make and we, none of us have the opportunity or the time, frankly, to remain still because it, it, the world is passing us by.
So what does this mean for me and my, my career and my professional path? Well, if you think about where I came from and the things that I've experienced, I am very passionate about nursing education. It's my profession. I have uh, built nursing programs. I have taught, I have led, I have led faculty. I have presented, I have written standards. I have consulted. I have done all things related to nursing education and educational competency. And so when you think about that, I always think about nursing and how I always explained it to my students was nursing is an umbrella. The more you know, the higher your umbrella goes and you have more responsibility, not less. So as an, as an educator, as a PhD prepared nurse, as a nurse who has experiences with, with you know, fill in the blank, uh, that umbrella just gets higher and higher. And so not only do I now have responsibility for the clients and the communities that I served as a clinical nurse, I also have a higher responsibility to the nursing profession, to my institution, to the faculty and to the students. And those, res those responsibilities uh, you know, should weigh heavy on us and your responsibilities will be different than my responsibilities, but your accountabilities will also be tied to those. And my accountabilities are to create uh, therapeutic and supportive learning environments, curriculum and resource that support uh, the, the uh, ideas and the caring that we want to see in our graduates, faculty competency for, for um, working with students, for identifying challenges in, with students, and also for um, you know, delivering competent and culturally sensitive education. And then the practice environment. If you think about it, my, my responsibility doesn't end when my student graduates. Um, I need to ensure that their practice is consistent with the, the way in which we would want to uh, deliver a diverse and inclusive care. And then also, you know, we have responsibilities, all of us, to ensure that we are uh, making sure that policy and our advocacy matches and is consistent with uh, the, the way we want to see care delivered and uh, the advocacy that we have for uh, marginalized groups. So one thing um, I, you may not be familiar with this, but the social determinants of health are a huge framework to help us as we do our diversity and equity work. Um, the social determinants of learning, interestingly, are, fall into five categories and they overlap with the social determinants of health. The social determinants of learning really determine how successful a student will be. In, in their educational pursuits. So again, if you go back to my history and uh, kind of my upbringing, uh, I, I did have physical health, thankfully, uh, psychosocial challenges in my family. My physical environment was safe uh, as an adult growing up, not so much. Uh, my social environment, I was not socialized to the role of a student. I had no idea what I was doing. And then on top of that, I had no idea what it really meant to be a nurse. And then you think about the self-motivation, resiliency, and the idea of that, um, that can be challenging as well. And so when we think about uh, health education for our patients, these determinants apply as well. But as a nurse educator, as someone who is focused on improving the curriculum and learning environments for students, we have to think holistically about the student beyond just what's happening in the classroom. The other thing that I think is really important when we think about holistic care and holistic practice is this idea of unity wellness, the interrelationship of human beings and their environment, um, which is the definition of, of holistic nursing and recognizing that all of us come with different intersectionality and so do our patients. And so putting anyone into a box, all it does is limit our understanding and our capacity to deliver, deliver uh, compassionate care. So, you know, you can have multiple um, things on the intersectionality list that will then impact the way that you care or communicate with individuals. And so being, being uh, you know, well-versed in each one of those and how they, how they connect together and how the social determinants of health overlay on top of those 
will really help you understand and be more compassionate and more caring and more open um, as you care for your patients. This is one of the very best articles I re I've read for a lay person. I, I love this picture uh, and it, it, just, it was accompanied this article that was in the New York Times in 2020. Um, this was something I read after my it's complicated uh, kind of come coming uh, self reflection episode. And it's what I recommend to people who, who want to know more about what does it mean to be an active bystander and what does it mean to be an ally and the differences that, that are there and the importance that we have in actually using our voice and, and taking action. Uh, okay, and then my last comment is just that, you know, life is just like a painting, just like the portrait of nursing. We draw our lines with hope, we erase the errors with tolerance, we dip the brush with lots of patience and add color um, with love. And I am so thankful that I have the opportunity to uh, share my story with all of you. And I would be happy to answer any questions or share any experiences that I've had with how I dealt with uh, you know, racism and stereotyping and uh, all these things in curriculum and advocated for students and student rights um, or really anything else that you have questions about, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much for sharing. That was, that was wonderful. And I, um, I appreciate all the quotes that you included and then 